three seconds, three verses. Not three seconds, that would be amazing. Um, but before that, we're going to actually, um, we're going to actually play a video, and it's on right now. The books of first and second Kings. Although they're two separate books in our Bibles, they were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel to King Forehead. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom. And God promised that from his line would come a Messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of a long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends, focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section, ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon are very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel. And he even completes David's scheme to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all this gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple, he makes really horrible choices, and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth, he builds a huge army, he even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's king, Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this, they rebel and secede, and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David, and now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf is all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, zero for 20, and then in southern Judah, only 8 out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light for the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections, for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. The most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. 
Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert. And his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in the famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both built altars and prayed to their god, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates this spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows up gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. And the capital city of Samaria is conquered, and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so, God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decisions. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings, like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it, he's convicted, and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up, Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is, how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the Messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. And you were like, I always wanted to know what the whole book of Kings was about. One and two, and now you do. <laughs> You're smarter than everyone in the world about the first and second Kings now. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in here because I don't have that much time. And if I move too fast, it's not because I'm trying to trick you or manipulate you. It's because I really believe that within this text we really find something that God wants us as a church family to hear, but also just for the church in San Francisco to hear. So I'm going to go as fast as I can, uh, but I, 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 will, I will be harnessed. Sound good? Okay. 2 Kings chapter 22, 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of uh, Bozkath. 
And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the way of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In the 18th year of King Josiah, fast forward it, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, in that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people, and let it be given into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the workmen who are to the house of the Lord, preparing um, the house, that is, to the carpenters and to the builders and to the masons, and let them use it for buying timber and um, quarried stone to repair the house. But no accounting shall be asked of them, for the money that is delivered into their hands, for they, do, they deal honestly. Verse 8. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book, the law, the Torah, in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hokiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes asunder. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Achim the son of Shaphan and Akbar the son of uh, Micaiah and Shaphan the secretary and Isaiah the king's servant saying this, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that, there has been, that, that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us. Judah, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book, to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, and Achim, and Akbar, and Shaphan, and Asai uh, went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, son of Harhaz, sorry, it's easy for you guys to say, um, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place, upon its inhabitants, all the, worlds of the, uh, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, and they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants. And they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and you have wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. And they brought back the word to the king. Verse 1, Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in there, hearing all the words, the book of the covenant, that they had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar. And he made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul and to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. These are God's words. We pray with him. God, we want to be vessels that can be filled up to be poured out. Lord, all of these things are not for our knowledge or for our gain so that we can show how awesome we are through the text that we've learned and all the history that we learned and all the context 
that we've learned, but would we be vessels that would be filled up with your spirit so that we could be poured out for others, poured out as servants, poured out for San Francisco, to love San Francisco well, to love our community well. Lord, would you allow your spirit and your word to speak to us as, they, as you spoke to King Josiah. In your name, amen. So, we have... Uh, We've been going through uh, portraits of Israel. So we're going through the whole Bible. If, if you're new with us, we're going through the whole Bible. We're going through the whole major story of the Bible. And right now we are in the portraits of Israel. So what I did was I took four different kings. And usually those kings were representatives or uh, uh, speakers for the whole nation. So we looked at um, the first king David, right? Or excuse me, we didn't look at first king David. We looked at the first king Saul, right? And the first king Saul, he had a problem with Power And what we learned, what the problem with power was this, that it is not through strength that brings nations to its knees. It is not through strength that it's true power, but it's through service, service and sacrifice, through weakness of what Jesus Christ did. We saw that power become, became incarnate, right? Became flesh in the weak servant, the one that became power, power and power. And, and grace for us all, which is Jesus. So we saw that the problem was is that power is not an object, but it is a person. The second thing is that we looked at pleasure. We looked at King David's life and we saw his fall from grace, that he had so many great things going for him, but then he saw something that he wanted, and there was a pleasure that was unchecked and untethered. He looked at Bathsheba. He wanted her, and what David knew all along in the Psalms is he said, I walk in a white place, the law of liberty. God, you have given me great lines for me to have, and I want the thing outside of your will for me. And he said, he knew this, he said, in your presence there's fullness of joy, and in your right hand there's pleasures forevermore. That pleasure is not necessarily a concept, but the problem of pleasure is pleasure is within a person. It's through Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ gave up his pleasure so that we might have the pleasure of God. Right? When we talk about the problem is, is it's not all of these things, it's, it's in a person. But then we looked at Solomon, King, the, King Solomon, right? And King Solomon, we saw the problem of prudence and the problem of wisdom. And what was his problem? His problem is he asked for wisdom, which was great. But then he started doing all of these different things and, and, and using his wisdom and his strategy for his own gain. And he thought that the strategy, right, the wisdom that we see in Proverbs, which is always personified as a woman or personifies as a human being, that the wisdom of God is not strategies for us to learn, but it is a person to fall in love with. Who is our wisdom? Who is the mighty counselor? Jesus. The problem is, is we start looking at all of these things that I can grab, put it in myself, and manipulate it. But God says, I take the, the, the powerful things and I make them foolish. Make them push. I use the cross through weakness and I bring about strength. And so today we look at the last king, and his problem was the problem of passion. And you could probably already start connecting to the dots of what the problem was. But let's look at this really quickly. We see Augustine of Hippo, he says this Hope has two beautiful daughters. I wouldn't name your daughter this, so don't get any ideas. He says, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are. And courage to see that they do not remain as they are. I'll say that again. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage. Courage to see that they do not remain as they are. You put those things together and you get this concept of passion. It's a mixture of anger and courage. In the Hebrew, they use the word cleave. When Moses wanted to see God's glory, he would cleave to the cleft of the rock. Knowing that things should not be the same way that the people cannot just walk into the desert place, but he wanted to, the people to understand and see his glory. 
like Augustine or Augustine, wherever you study, and King Josiah, we are all longing to see things be reformed and renewed. We realize that things are not the way that they're supposed to be. Death, sickness, depression, anxiety, and evil. Josiah looks at a long line of kings, and he's passionate for Judah. He's passionate. He has seen what has happened to the northern tribes of Israel, how they have gone into slavery. Why? Because they did not follow the ways of the Lord. They went for their own things, their own ways. They followed out after dumb idols. Even though all the prophets and all the cultural watchdogs said, don't go that way, don't go that way. They're open secularists. Don't go that way. They're things that are over-promising and under-delivering. Don't go that way. I have made you an inhabitant of all this land. And see, this is the interesting thing. As God calls all of the people right, of Israel to move into this land and drive out everybody else in there. The only people that can actually be in this land is the people that follow after the way of Yahweh, that are in covenant of Yahweh. What do we see with Israel, though? We see Israel leaving the realm, leaving the way of Yahweh, and what ends up happening is we see the first part of Israel Right? That got broken into half. The northern tribe. Because they did not follow after God, they were driven out. See, God's not a favoritism type person that says, oh, I like the Jews, but I don't like everybody else. He says, I have created a people for myself, and I will drive everybody out that doesn't meet that requirement. Even the Jews. And every time we see the Israelites Going after idols, going after these things, what did God do? God drove them out of the land of promise. Because the land of promise is not just for the Jews, but for the covenant people of God. In 2 Kings 22, uh, chapter 23 23, we are introduced to the descendant from the line of King David, Josiah. King Josiah becomes king at a very young age, at eight years old, and is said to walk in the way of King David, not looking to the left. Or the right. Josiah looks at the long line of kings and is passionate for Judah to follow after God. See, perhaps this is why we are called and even reminded today to know that there is a reason for our deep and passionate longing for reform in our world and renewal with our relationships. That the same thing that Josiah sees his kingdom and says, I have something burning inside of me. I'm angry and I have this courage because I want to see the world made right. So let's look in this passage to see that the passion we have for reform and renewal is from God and for our good, but ultimately we will find out it isn't enough. Sorry, giving it away. So because people, we are the people that are falling apart, we must be passionate before God for reformation and renewal in our lives. So let's look at verse 1. Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign. I was thinking about that. I'm going to kind of tell you how young I am as a pastor. I'm not ashamed kind of a little bit. But, um, you know, I was thinking about 20 years ago when I was 8 years old. So you did the math. Good job. Um, uh, when I was uh, 20 years old, uh, O.J. Simpson, uh, he uh, was on trial. Um, Legends of the Hidden Temple. Um, that was a really big thing on Nickelodeon. Gap was a really fun thing to use. Moon shoes were really fun. Do you guys what, no, remember what moon shoes were? If, you, if you're older, you're like, I had kids that like moon shoes. I, I, I get that. When I, when I was a kid, you know, we, it was the first time PlayStation came out when I was eight years old. Now we see Josiah the king. We see Josiah the king that should be liking PlayStation and Gap. We see the king of Josiah that's just a young boy, and he says already that he, it says in verse 2, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the way of David his father. He did not turn aside to the right or the left. He looked forward to Jerusalem. He looked forward to God. He looked forward to the pursuit of God. I love this, because think about this. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, if you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you have to be as what? Child. You have to be as a child. 
And I love this because I almost feel like the way of David is being like a child. Think of when David was anointed. No one was around. You know, he was just with him and his harp and he was singing songs. And Samuel the prophet went to all the brothers that were stronger and bigger. And God said no, and God said no, and God said no, and God said no. And they said, well, we have one guy. We, we, have, a, we have a son, but he's, he's, he's young. He's with the sheep. He's rocking out on his heart. He, he's, he's over there. I love this because we see and are introduced to this guy named King Josiah. He's eight years old and he did not want to go out of the way of the Lord. So we're going to see three things. Passion for reform, passion for renewal, and passion for righteousness. Um, who, knows, uh, what, uh, who knows what San Francisco is named after? San Francisco is named after who? St. Francis of what? Very good. Very good, church. St. Francis. That is our patron saint of San Francisco. And so as you can tell, he was born where? Very good job. Very good job. Do you know what his name really was? Giovanni Francesco. And then like Bernardo or something like that. Son of a wealthy merchant. As a young man, Francis led a worldly, carefree life. An early biographer said this. He squandered his time terribly. Indeed, he outshone, I love this, indeed he outshone all of his friends in his, uh, uh, in, in his childishness and his tri trivialities. Trivialities? Trivialities. Trivialities. That's the word. Tri trivialities. That's the word. That's what I meant. Trivialities. There you go. <laughs> I was thinking about San Francisco, and I was thinking about how trivial a lot of things that we do here. Preach, right? Right? I mean, think about it. On the weekends, what we do with our time, what we do with our lives. I, I think it's so funny that St. Francis, that this city is named for, it longs to outshine in trivial things. Not saying that you're doing anything wrong or having passions or liking things. It's fine. But sometimes I feel like we outshine others. Not saying, you know, 420 wasn't a fun thing, right? It was so much traffic, I was just... I, I, was, I was not having a good day. I don't know if you know, 420 in the park happened this week, and it was not a, a good time for Josh Sisko trying to drive back home. Um, it, it, it was not. But the things that I think that we deal with and we see is the same as St. Francis. In 1202, he marched off to the battle against the city of Pergia, full of young man's dreams of military glory, but he was taken prisoner during the battle. And a year um, and a year passed before his father could arrange a ransom. That was followed by years of convalescence in Assisi. A year in which France now in his early uh, Francis in his early 20s was slowly transformed. During his illness, he experienced dreams and visions. One day as he prayed in a depleted church in Saint, uh, San Dimanio uh, at the edge of Assisi, he heard Christ say three times from him from the crucifix. So he's he, he's, he, he was sick, he was hearing from God, he went to this, this church that was ran down, and he, he was right in front of the cross, and he heard this three times. Listen to this. Francis, go repair my house, which as you can see is falling completely to ruin. Francis, go repair my house. Francis, go repair my house. Francis, go repair my church. So Francis understood that he was to repair the church he prayed in. So he, he, God's calling him to repair the church, and he's thinking, oh, I guess this church that's falling down. Oh, you, you want me to help repair this one? So what does he do? Well, Francis, uh, Francis uh, he, he, ends up, he ends up saying, uh, though he was called to, when, uh, so Francis understood that he was to repair the church and prayed in, um, through his followers later would see as his call to reform the church. So he proceeded to sell off family goods to raise money for repairs, right? So when his father caught wind of this, he was furious. He dragged Francis before the local bishop to, for, uh, to force his son into changing his unseemly behavior and to pay him back. In the course of the interview, when, when his father grabbed him and brought him to the bishop and said, you know, let's, this guy's too passionate, too excited about the things of God. You know what Francis does? I love this. I didn't know this, and I love this. Ready? Francis took off his clothes and laid them neatly in a pile before his father. He said, up to, day, up to today, I called you father, he said to him. 
But now I can say in all honesty, our Father who art in heaven. He walked out of the cathedral to become a hermit and to be alone in solitude and in silence. A biographer noted he went out there and to, to be in solitude and silence to hear the secrets which God could reveal to him. Other inspirations followed. One day in a church, he heard from the Gospel of Matthew, Take no gold or silver or copper in your wallet, no bag for your journey, no two tunics and sandals or a staff. He took it literally and began an itinerant life. He intended to live in utter simplicity and to preach the Gospel that usually entailed strong injunctions to repent. He denounced evil wherever he found it, wrote one early biographer, and made no effort to palliate it, right, or to make it, make it palatable. From him, a life of sin met with outspoken rebuke and not support. That is who San Francisco is named after. What an amazing man. What an incredible man. You remember when we were saying all creatures are regarding king? You know who wrote that song? St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah, it's all coming together now. Um, but we see this great Catholic monk that he ended up creating the Franciscan order which they lived a life of simplicity and loved after God and was, that, that dealt ruthlessly with sin. And though God called him to repair the church, he was actually calling him to reform it. I love this. So what we see right now is we see passion for reform. In first, uh, 2 Kings 1-12, through 12, what do we see? We see Josiah going through those things and he sends a high priest and he says, go up, go up to the high priest, go up to the temple of God and see what's going on. See, passion for renewal, passion, anytime that you guys come to knowing that you need to change or you need to repent or you need to do something different. When you see the world and you say, man, this world is all about materialism and it's all about consumerism and it's all about me, me, me or what I can get or what I can do and the principalities and the darkness of what I can do and the centrality of who I am and you look at this world and you say, something needs to break the cycle, something needs to change and God, would you start with me? And where do you go? Where else do you go? You go to the church. You go to the table. You go to the word. You go to the worship in the, with the forever family. Where do you go? When you know that there needs to be reform in the world, where do you go? Go to God. You go to the church. You go to the house of God. And what does Josiah do when he wants to become passionate and he wants to reform? He goes to the house of God. But when they go to the house of God, what ends up happening? Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. No, duh. Where do you think the, where do you think the, the book of the Lord's going to be? It's going to be in his house. And what we see is we see from the outer courts to the inner courts to where it dwells. And what we've seen is we've seen it going to a relationship with the Israelites, going straight from temple, now going straight to Torah. And what we see now is with um, Judaism in our world has actually left temple and gone more towards Torah, right? And this is where it first kind of started happening, where it was not temple-focused as much as it was Torah-focused. But this is the thing. No matter how passionate you are for the house of the Lord, and no matter how passionate you are for the Torah and the Word of God and the covenant and what everything that it has to say, it still isn't enough for true reform. But I love this. He hears the word of the Lord. When is the last time, listen to me, be honest here. When is the last time you have read something from God? You've read something in the Bible as we're reading through it, and you have just said, I want to tear off my shirt. I, 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 I want to rip off my, I am so disgusted. I am so angry. I want things not to be this way. I've seen sin. I've seen death. I've seen brokenness in this world. And as I see what God's original plan for us is to live within a renewed life, to love others, I just want to rip off my clothes. When's the last time? When's the last time you fell on your face before God and said, God, please bring renewal, please bring reform to our world? Would we be passionate? Like Josiah, to not only go to the house of the Lord, to repair the house of the Lord. You, you're saying, Josh, I'm bored. I, you know, I don't feel you know, satisfied in my life. I, I don't do it. And I'm saying, okay, well, um, where's your temple at? Where's your temple at? Well, 
Josh, I don't know what you're talking about. Where do you worship? Where do you worship? Where do you worship? Who are you worshiping? If you're worshiping yourself and your desires and your pleasure, and you're worshiping smaller things, lesser things than God, absolutely you will feel unsatisfied. Absolutely you will look to everything else and they will constantly overpromise. And God is asking you today, what are you worshiping? What are you doing? Martin Luther says this, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. What is, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. And I would say right now, as we see this, there is a passion for the house of God. Where is the house of God in your life? Where is the word of God in your life? Is the word of God allowed to speak to you? To change your mind, to reform your heart, to, 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 for reformation. That's a beautiful world. Think about it. We were formed from the ground. There was a formation. And then God wants to reform our world and our lives through his very word. And then we see at the end, when Cain heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Achim the son of Shaphan, and Akbar the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and, the Asai, uh, and Asaiah the king's servant, saying, Go inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the word of his book that has been found. He had a passion for God's people to have reform. I love this. It starts with his own heart. He goes to the house of worship. He says, God, I have, I, have, I have gone away from you all, and I start repairing your house. If you are bummed out, come to the house of God. Come and serve. Come and love the Golden City Church. Your heart will be reformed. Come and read the Bible. Read the Word of God, and let it reform your heart. But then lastly, does the reformation of your heart long for other people in the congregation, other people that say, this is the house of God, these are the people of God, does it call you guys for a reform of people. A loving reform of people. And you say, Josh, I'm not into that. I'm good with myself. I'm good with my own church. I'm good with my own family. But I, I don't, I don't want to push it onto other people. If you love people, if you love and see that there is a, 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 a good thing for people that they are being ripped off of by going to other houses of worship, going to other idols, going to other things, would it not behoove you? Would it not benefit them to call for reform and to call for change passionately? So we see a passion for reform, but then we see secondly the passion for renewal. So he goes and he says, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to according to all that is written concerning us. So Hokiah the priest and Achim the, and, and Akbar and Shaphan and Asiah, Asiah went to Hodal the prophetess. I love this. This is a first, one of the first mentions we, we, we learn of a prophetess. A, a, a woman watchdog for the covenant. And Josiah, this king, says, I, 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 okay, I, I see that the, temp, the temple and God's house needs to be repaired. I see that the word of God, and what the word of God is, is the covenant. It's a covenant that God made, not only with Moses, that they would walk in it and stand in it. That was the concept. The concept is standing in what God has called them to stand in. In. But not only that, but with Abraham, that he would make a great descendant, and that through him the whole world would be blessed, that not only the whole world would be blessed, but new renewal, a eternal renewal will come through this family. Josiah sees this and he says, that's in the covenant, and that's what I want. I see something that isn't, and I want it to be this way, and how are we going to reform back to what God has called us to do? Today, in your heart, have you seen too, do, like duplicity in yourself of what God has called you to and where you are. Where God has called you to and where you are. And what we see within the temple, what we see with the word of God is God is trying to bring us back through his cords of love. And see, we see this passion for renewal and he goes and inquires to the providence and he says, 
tell me, what do we do with this stuff? You're the covenant watchdog. You're the person to tell me what to do. We want to change. We want to transform. I have passion for it. I do not want to become like the northern tribe that gives themselves to idols and therefore becomes enslaved and out of the promised land. I want to stand in the gap. I want to stand in the gap, Josiah says. And she says, they are too far gone. The covenant has already been broken. But I will tell you this, Josiah, because you would stand in the gap, because you have become a man that would not shy away from the opportunity to love your God and be in covenant with your God, you shall not have the disaster come upon your head. You shall die and not see the rest of Israel go into exile. You will live alone like, this is what I love. This is what Martin Luther says. You know what Martin Luther said? Martin Luther says this. He goes, if, 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 um, if, if, the end of where, if everything falls apart and the end of the world you know, is tomorrow and everything falls up, I will still plant an apple tree. He says, though everything looks damaged and destruction is tomorrow, I will still do good till the end of days. And this is what Josiah does. Josiah hears it and he hears the words of the Lord. He hears the requirements that is required of him. And do you know what he does? What does he do? He says, I'm still going to go do good. I know that the covenant of God, I am going to live long and I really can't do anything about this. But I'm still going to do good. And today you say, hey, I'm saved, Josh. I'm good. I have fire insurance. I've, I've believed in God. I don't have to do anything else. So you don't do good? You don't seek the good of San Francisco? You don't seek the reformation of the church of God in San Francisco? You will not be a person that stands in the gap for San Francisco? Let us be like Martin Luther. Let us be a man that would stand in the gap. And what does he do? He's passionate for renewal. And what do we see? He says, he, in the renewal part, he rescinds all of the idols. He gets into all the idols. And he says, all these people have been worshiping other gods no longer. You see, Josh, this is our kid. Idols, little dolls and stuff that you worship. We do that every single day and we don't even see it. We, we worship lesser things than gods. We put things in high places that only God should be in our lives. We revolve our, our lives not only around ourselves, but on the things that we can get. Dumb idols. Idols that can't speak and talk. And they can't challenge you. They don't challenge you. And if you have allowed yourself to allow idols to come into your heart, I would say, please, rescind them. Man's nature is so to speak, John Calvin said, is a perpetual factory of idols. We constantly make things in the place of God. And you know the sad thing is, it's usually good things like, like work and family and children. We take good things from God and we, we, we make them lesser by not handing them over to God the Creator. We make them lesser and we say, they're mine. There are moral things that could never satisfy me. That there is a God-shaped hole, as Augustine says. That there's a God-shaped hole and that the only thing that can fill it is Him. And that our hearts will be restless until we find rest in God. So we see Josiah, he rescinds the idols. He, he gets away from the idols of the people. He goes, he goes and he does renewal by learning the requirement. He says, what must be done right? How must be done? And he seeks after God. And then lastly, he renews through the covenant. He says, I want to be a people that stand in the gap. Verse 18, but the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard. Because your heart was penitent, when it was passionate, you humbled yourself before the Lord, and you heard how I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants as they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I have also heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will give your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster I will bring to this place. Then the king sent all the elders of Judah. So he hears all this word, and then he goes and, he goes and says, The king sent all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him, and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, small 
and great, from the least to the greatest. And he read their hearing of the word of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the, the king, this is the, the key word in the Hebrew, stood by his testimonies and his statutes. And all, or excuse me, stood by the pillar. And he was, actually that was an image of him being a pillar. And made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, all his soul, to perform the words and covenant that were written in his book. And all the people joined in the covenant. That word join actually meant stand. Stand in covenant. Not only was there an individual that wanted to stand, but it was a group of people that said, we will stand together. We will stand for the reformation and the renewal of our kingdom. And not only is it a renewal from Exodus 20, when we see the Ten Commandments and to do well, but it was a renewal of the Abrahamic covenant and a renewal of the Davidic covenant. That through Josiah, his reign, that there would come a Redeemer. One that is not just passionate, but is truthful. Not one that is just passionate, but performs what is necessary to bring true, eternal joy. And his name is Jesus. Sad hearts weep no more. He has healed the brokenhearted. He has opened wide the prison doors. He is able to deliver evermore. Why? Because passionate for reform and passionate, being passionate for renewal, renewal can only bring you so far. See, there was another man that tried to stand in the gap. Martin Luther. Martin Luther remarked and said, I hated the word, the righteousness of God. He hated that word, Martin Luther said. By which I had been taught according to the customs and the use of all teachers. That God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. The young Luther could not live by faith because he was not righteous and he knew it. Meanwhile, he was ordered to take his doctorate in Bible and become a professor at Wittenberg University. During, um, during lectures on Psalms in 1513 and 1514 and a study of the book of Romans, he began to see a way through his dilemma. He could not understand how he could be righteous but also live by faith. And he thought that he could actually live a life of faith if he was righteous. He had the equation flipped. Listen to this. He goes, at last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through the righteous life and the righteous living by the gift of God, namely faith. Here I felt as I were totally and entirely born again and entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. What? Is it possible for Christians to experience a life that is born again and good and knowing that your righteousness is secured by faith alone? <laughs> Absolutely. And Martin Luther says this. So on the heels of this new understanding um, um, came others. To the apostolic succession, instead it was the community of those who had been given faith. Salvation came not by the sacraments, as such by it came from faith. That the idea that human beings had spark of goodness enough to seek out for God was not foundation of the theology, but was taught only by fools. Humility was no longer a virtue that earned grace, but necessary response to the gift of grace. Faith no longer consisted of the assenting to the church's teachings, but of the trusting in the promises of God and the merits of the church, or of Christ. It's not looking at the church, but looking at the merits of Christ. And this is how it happens. So we see a man that wanted to stand in the gap. Did you know Martin Luther was struck by lightning? Yeah, that would change me up too. So he got struck by lightning. He goes and he becomes a monk. He learns and he studies and studies and studies. And somebody says, man, you're such a good guy. You're so passionate about God. You must really love him. You know what he says? He's just a cruel taskmaster that wants more and more and more. I can't give it to him. But then he learned about salvation, not through his righteousness, but through faith that brought about the righteousness of God. Not through his own works, but through the work of what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. And do you know what ends up happening? A true reform in the Christian church. In 1521, he was called to an assembly at Worms, Germany. I want to move there. Just kidding. To appear before Charles V. Holy Roman Emperor. Luther arrived prepared for another debate. He quickly discovered it was a trial at which he was asked to recant all of his views. All of what the scriptures have brought up and he wanted to reform what was happening because they were asking for indulgences, right? That if you gave these things, if you bought these things from the Catholic Church, that you could actually be saved and be okay and be in right standings. 
And Martin Luther said this is absolutely antithetical against the word of God, against the grace that has been afforded to me. And Luther replied this, unless I can be instructed. And think about this. He's in front of the Holy Roman Empire. There's no, emperor. There's no one more big or great than him. He's wearing his, his outfit and the, the monk, Martin Luther, is right there before him. Right? And this is what he says. Unless I can be instructed and convinced with evidence from the Holy Scriptures or with open and clear and distinct grounds of reasoning, then I cannot and will not recant because it is neither safe nor wise to act against conscience. And he says this. I love this. Here I stand and I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Amen. See, Martin Luther reformed a church and start the Protestant Reformation. And a great work came out of him because he looked to the temple of God, right? He ran to the, the temple of God was enough. He needed to look at the word of God that told him that it was not by his merits or works for righteousness, but by grace. He studied the word of God. But that passion wasn't enough. The passion wasn't enough because he went across right in front of the church. And the church was saying to him and being in front of them and saying this, you have to repent your views. And he says, here I stand, I can do no other. He escapes from the Wartburg Castle as a convicted heretic. Torah is good and gives shape to love for God, but if the heart is not right, the law kills. As noted above, as we see in 2 Kings chapter 21, 22, and 23, the law drives to Christ and to faith in him. The law comes to genuine realization only in faith, and the law, therefore, exalts the glory and power of God who raises the dead. The law is realized through an incarnate word, Torah, made flesh. It is not just the temple that we need. It is not just the word that we need. We see... We see... In 2 Kings 23, 21 through 23, right before Josiah the king goes away, he does something that only one other king had done, or one other person, leader of the Israelites, had done, J Joshua. He goes, I, I love this guy, Josiah. Man, read his story again. He reforms the temple. He reforms the reading of the word of God and the covenant of God, seeking renewal. But lastly, he realizes it comes down to righteousness that they need. And the king commanded all his people, Let us keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. For no such Passover had been kept since the day of the judges who judged Israel, or during all the days of the kings of Israel, or of the kings of Judah, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, 18-year-old reigning king, or maybe 26 at that time, a little younger than me, Passover was kept to the Lord in Jerusalem. Romans 8, 3 through 4 says this, For God has done what the law, weakened by flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Josiah's reform is literally framed by the covenant ceremony and the Passover held in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, the same year he discovers the book of Torah in the temple. Thus the passage as a whole moves from the covenant renewal at the temple to the great sabbatical feast of the first month. Josiah reserve, uh, reverses the order of Joshua. Joshua begins with Passover and then embarks on the conquest to destroy the shrines and the idols of the Canaanites. While Josiah destroys the shrines of the Canaanites of Israel and celebrates Passover. Listen to me who know righteousness. As it says, the people in whose heart is my law. Passion for more form is great. Passion for renewal is greater. But a passion for the righteousness through sacrifice, that is the greatest. What do we see through Passover? Passover was saying this, that the reason why, Israelites, you were, slaved out, or you were saved out of slavery, that, you're, that you can actually be transformed and renewed in your life. If you're saying, Josh, I want to reform, I want to do these things, I am passionate for reform, I am passionate for renewal, I'm passionate for what God has for me, you have to seek out sacrifice. And he goes to Passover, because what does Passover bring about? Sabbath. What does Sabbath bring about? Sabbath was saying this, it was not one finger, Israelites, that you lifted that got you out of slavery and brought you into covenant with me. 
It was not one thing that you've done. It was all what Jesus Christ had done or God had done through them. And they would celebrate Sabbath. Why? Because they would have that day saying, all of the work of my hands, everything that I've gotten, uh, been given to me has been a gift of God. And therefore, I'm going to celebrate in the finished work that God has done. And I see, like Stephen, Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father, the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world, that not only passion of reform and renewal is not enough, but passion is the passion of Christ. It is the passion that he suffered. That word passion in the Greek was a suffering, a suffering and enduring because he said, things are not right. Things are not right. We are separated from God and the only way is through a sacrifice, the only reform, the only renewal that the world can ever experience and the world can ever know is if Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, would be shed for you and for me and for the rest of the world. And I look at Stephen as he's about to be martyred and he looks up to heaven and he sees God's or Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And they all wondered, why was he standing? Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God, not standing. He was standing as an advocate saying, I'm the one. I'm the one, Stephen, that is standing in the gap. I am the one that is standing for you. I am the great advocate. Though everybody says that reform and renewal and transformation and life come from others, it is the Lamb that is not dead any longer, but is resurrected and he is standing in you want transformation, you want renewal to 